My companions who preach the gospel do it not for vanity, profession, or a personal goal. They do it for the passion they have for souls. When I had my encounter with Jesus, I remember as if it had been yesterday. When I had my encounter with the Lord Jesus, it was born at that moment an indescribable passion for people. I remember that I had become a boring. I talked about Jesus to everyone. Everyone. Even when people didn't want to hear, I spoke about Jesus. It was at school, at work, I talked about Jesus to everyone. I insisted with people, my colleagues concerning Jesus. I insisted. I remember, just to give an idea, as my mind was changed, because until then, before I had an encounter with Jesus, I only thought about myself. I thought of my personal projects. But when I had this encounter with him, I forgot my projects and personal dreams. I stopped dreaming my dreams to dream the dreams of God. I stopped dreaming my own dreams to dream the dreams of the Holy Spirit, of the Lord Jesus. I became a passionate for souls. I remember that one occasion I was studying, taking a course. I was talking to a colleague of mine about the Lord Jesus. And every day I spoke to him about Jesus. Every day. Every day, you know. Until one day, he turned to me and said, Edi, I did not come here to hear about Jesus. I have my religion and you have yours. I want to study. I have a target. I want to pass the exam. I was ashamed, embarrassed, very embarrassed. And when I left the course, I went from Franklin Roosevelt to my house on foot through the aterro. I was crying, literally crying, crying and saying, oh Jesus, I wanted to save him for you. I wanted to save him for you. I am ashamed. I cried because I had spoken to a person of Jesus and I got a no. Finally, I had received a no. It touched me deeply. So what I do today, I do not do it for personal greed, for professionalism or personal vanity, personal goal or a personal reason. No. We do not work for money. We do not work to achieve a better status. I will confess to you. I would like to have a boat to travel, surf. I would like to. I would like to live in a place, a faraway place, country house, but I can't. I'm able to do it, but I can't. Why? Because I will not have time. I will not enjoy these things because of my passion to be on the altar, fighting for you. So, nothing in this world enchants me, draws me, 
except souls. This happens not only with me, but with all the pastors of the Universal Church. They also think that way. And if by chance there are some watching me now and do not think that way, sooner or later they will get out. How good it would be if they come out now to leave space for others. But that's the universal church of the kingdom of God. The church was born because I thought on the suffered ones. Those who were going to hell. Every second, many people are entering hell. Many of them. While I'm preaching here, there are people dying and going to hell. And the more people are born, more people will die and more people will go to hell. And Jesus will not send angels to preach the gospel to these people. He counts on us. He counts on those who believe in him, who surrender to him, who love him truly. That's why he tells Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. So now you know what is the love you have towards Jesus. You can say to me, I love Jesus, I love the souls. But you know if you love Jesus or not. You know. You know now who you are. Now you recognize the kind of love that you have towards Jesus. It is measured according to the love you have towards people. Who often you do not even know. Because we love people who sometimes even want our death. Which kind of Christian are you? Ah, I'm faithful in church, faithful tither, I do not live in sin. My life is from home to work, from work to home, and I go to church. I am a person who lives my faith. Peter also did this. But I ask. What is your love for souls? Honestly. You are capable of giving a kidney to your son or daughter. You are capable of dying instead of your son or daughter. But I ask you, would you be capable of dying for someone? In order to save someone or help that one? When we are born of God, when we are born of the Holy Spirit, our goals, thoughts are contrary to the thoughts of this world and they are in line with God's thoughts when we are born of God our heart beats according to God's heart we do not look at our purposes but at the others now verify if this is not what is written in the first commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your strength, and with all your mind. Yes or no? All. All. A hundred percent. And what is the second commandment? You will love yourself as to the Lord. Amen? No. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor as yourself, which is the cross. This is the cross. The vertical part 
of the cross is our love towards Jesus. The horizontal part is the love towards our neighbor. I think you seem to be shocked. I think many people are shocked now. Oh, I did not expect to hear it. It does not agree with my goals. Patience. I think many became goofy now. Oh, what is that? It means that my love for God is seen through my love for souls. That's it, exactly. If you do not love the souls, you do not love Jesus. If you love the souls, you love Jesus. And as you struggle for souls, you love Jesus. The more you give yourself for the souls, the more you love Jesus. The less you give for the souls, the less you love Jesus. But that does not mean you will not be saved. You will be. I just cannot guarantee you will receive a reward. If by chance you love Jesus your own way and keep your own faith and see only yourself, I do not guarantee you will receive the reward. But salvation is guaranteed to you while you keep your fidelity. Do you understand what I'm talking about? But the love I have towards my Lord is measured according to the love I have towards people, towards souls. Not only the souls of my family members, not just their souls, every soul in general. When we have that experience of being born again, at that moment, at first I cried for seeing my soul lost, for the necessity of salvation. And then the Holy Spirit showed me the Savior, who is Jesus. And I ran to him, and he saved me, forgave me. With his forgiveness, then I started crying. I poured the tears for the joy of my salvation. And in that joy of salvation, the Holy Spirit immediately, which is responsible for it, changed my mind on behalf of the people. And at that moment, I vowed to spend my life for the souls. Because I want for the people what God has given me. That's it. That's it. You know that human beings have a tendency. You go to a good doctor and immediately you tell your friends and relatives. Or oh, there's a doctor who is very good and he will help you. Yes or no? You go to a store and buy a good object of quality. Immediately you say, so and so, I bought this thing here and it's very good. If you want to buy it, you are in need of it. This story is very good. You go to the cinema and watch a movie that you liked. You say, what a good movie. Then your greatest pleasure is to pass to other people that that movie is good. This is not how it happens. Now imagine this on a much higher level. When you have an encounter with Jesus, imagine what happens within you. It's an immense desire, huge, endless, of wanting to save people for Jesus. And that's what happens with us. 
that happened to me and also with the other pastors. Bishop Clodomir was an outlaw. He mugged, robbed, etc. He and his brother, his brother was murdered because of the crime. But he did not. Because one day he had an encounter with, with Jesus. Since then, his goals have changed. He married to a woman of God to serve Jesus. He did not marry to a woman of God to build a family for his own pleasure. He married to a woman of God so that she could help him to save souls for Jesus. So when we have an encounter with Jesus, our goals immediately work about the salvation of souls, which is the natural expression of our love towards the Lord Jesus. The question is, do you love Jesus? Do you have courage to say, I love Jesus or not? Listen, you are looking like a goofy. Excuse me. Excuse my way of speaking. But you are looking so. And, and I'm sure that not only you, but also the people around the world who watch me now, because you reflect the church in general. You know that face, like that face without expression. So is your face. I'm sorry to speak like that. Do not get me wrong, but here where we are on the altar, we see everyone. From the altar, we have a, a broader view of everyone. Then you verify that even a mosquito in the midst of you, we are able to hear. Everyone is silent, stunned. And we are here with the converted ones. Imagine those who are not. As the Portuguese people say, oh, excuse me there. But that's the reality. Peter, do you love me? Jesus said this three times. Then we understand who loves and who does not love God through this text. Meditate carefully about it at home. Catch the spirit of this word. Try to extract the spirit of this episode, this conversation. Catch the spirit. And then you will discover why many times you believe in Jesus but are not happy. Are not happy. You have believed in Jesus are a believer for years but still live a life without taste anemic your smile is anemic your eyes are like of fish already dead for some days do you know how it is it's that eye without brightness because you deep down have been deceiving yourself. You have been deceiving yourself. Olha, 
Listen, I'll tell you something. If someone manifests with demon among you there, do not be surprised. Do not be surprised. Because we are touching on the wound of the church in general. You know the Bible, read the Bible fast, pray, you practice the Christian religion. But deep, deep down, you do not love Jesus. And do not love because you do not know him. That's it. You don't love him because you don't know him. Because when you know him, you love him. You fall in love with him. And you want to save souls. You think about others. When the person is of God, born of God, he thinks about his neighbors. And if the person is not of God, he is selfish. Only thinks about himself. He only thinks about his family. On himself. And the others can be damned. He think about himself. Do you love me? Right now, where you are. Bow down your head, please. Close your eyes. And ask yourself this question. Did not I tell you? While your head is bowed and your eyes closed, you can think, meditate, reason, and evaluate your love towards Jesus. And if by chance, my friends, you say, Bishop, may God have mercy on my soul. Because I thought I loved Jesus. But so far, I have loved myself. My family. But not the souls. So, honestly, I have not loved Jesus. As he wants to be loved and deserves to be loved. If you consider your life like that and you want to change this situation, then come before the altar to lay down your life to the Lord Jesus. You know now how to evaluate your love for Jesus. And what about your faith? How can you measure your faith? How can we measure our faith? I 
I believe that faith, the faith that brings forgiveness, salvation, blessing, God's answer, in short, the faith that pleases God is that which is shown by the surrender, surrender, the giving of oneself. When you hear about the heroes of faith in the past, you can see that none of them, none of them pleased God with a natural faith. All of them demonstrated their sacrifices, sacrificed their own lives. Because when we talk about faith, people think that it's just having a religion. When in fact, faith and religion have nothing in common. When we talk about faith, taking actions of faith, many people think that faith is praying, fasting, attending church or religion. And many believers, and also many of you, many have prayed, fasted, attended church, read the Bible. In short, has no sin, but have lived a tight life, tied, petty. You do not eat what you want. You eat what you have. You do not wear what you want. You wear what you have. Yes or no? Yes or no? Honestly. Who is able to say, really? Bishop, actually you are right. Who can say that, honestly? It's no use trying to deceive or try to justify as Job's friends did. No. This is the reality. This is the purest reality. I believe in God. I have lived my faith for 20, 30 40, 50 years. I know that I am of God. I'm sure of my salvation. I have the Holy Spirit. I'm sure about that. There isn't the slightest doubt that I have the Holy Spirit. But I do not eat what I want. I just eat what I have. The rest... I have not worn what I want. I wear what I have. I do not go to work with the transportation I want. No. I use what I have. It's bus, train, chariot, horseback, on foot, bicycle. I use what I have and not what I want. We have written that servants of hell ride horses while princes, which means the sons of God walk on the ground. I'm revolted for the people of the universal church of the kingdom of God. As other people from other churches, I have no responsibility. My responsibility is, is for you. Therefore, we guide you. We teach you. I get revolted when I see people wearing slippers on the foot. Wanting to wear the best. 
So, I'm not glad. I'm not happy. I am revolted about your case. Because the Bible that I preach is not a restricted Bible limited only to the spiritual well-being. The Apostle John said to Gaius, one of his disciples, I make vows for your prosperity as well as your soul is prosperous. I make vow for your prosperity and health. It means focusing on the material life, physical health, as well as his soul was prosperous. Then, prosperity, health, and spiritual life is what has to exist in your life. It's what has to happen to you. But why does it not happen? Why has it not happened? Precisely for this reason. Because there is an illusion regarding faith. The person thinks that believes. He believes that believes in God's word. He believes that believes in the word of God. But does not. Because belief involves Complete surrender, total, unrestricted. I have said this before, and I repeat it. When the Bible, through Paul, said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and will be saved you and your household. He wanted to say this. If you put your entire life, dedicate yourself of body, Soul and spirit. Surrender a hundred percent. Which means my life. Family. What I have. What I intend to have. What I will have. My whole future. I surrender in your hands. All my life. A hundred percent. My mind. Heart. My being. I surrender all to you Jesus. I marry you, Jesus. I surrender to you. I jump into your, your arms. I do this with absolute conviction that there is within me. I'm sure about that now. Neither wife, nor father, nor mother, nor son, nor husband, nor child. Nothing in this world. No money, no success. Nothing in this world is more valuable, more precious to me than the Lord. Then I give myself to you. I surrender a hundred percent. That's the faith that God wants from you. That's the faith that pleases God. It is faith that makes the family also be saved. The family also be saved. But if there is not this belief, this kind of belief, or there is that belief that the person thinks that believes in Jesus, deep down he says, I believe in Jesus, I believe in the Bible. But if I believed indeed, I would not sell the body for prostitution. If I really believed, I would not be a bad character, thief, deceiver. I would not give myself to addiction, drugs, wicked life of this world. I would not sell my soul for an extra marital pleasure. When a person believes in Jesus, he sacrifices the desires of his heart. He sacrifices his flesh. 
He satisfies himself with our daily bread and therefore does not need to eat the bread of the neighbor. He prefers the daily bread of his own table. Yes or no? Do you understand what I mean? When a person has faith that pleases God, he's not guided by the conversation of friends, fornications, nightlife. He does not let his friends influence him regarding to an undisciplined life, irregular. He's, he's not deluded by the conversation of friends from work or even indecent proposals of co-workers. He lives a, a life guided by the word of God because his life no longer belongs to him. He is a servant of God. My friends, pay attention. Just as the love of God has to do with the souls, your faith has a lot to do with your character. You live a restricted life, limited. A life different from others because of your faith. No, my life does not belong to me anymore. I will sacrifice. And you sacrifice with pleasure. Not only your offering. It's not only your offering. The offering is a materialization of the faith that is within you. The spirit that is within you. You give, but does not offer the best. So you verify that your surrender, your faith, are not the best. That is the purest reality. And God is not looking at your offering. But what is behind your offering. That is your life. Your soul. Ananias and Sapphira. Promised to give a land. And when they sold that land. They got a reasonable amount for it. So they decided to keep half. And give the other half. God does not need money. Offering. None of this. He is the owner of everything. So if he is the owner of everything. Why do we give offering. Tithe. For the tithe and offerings. Represent or symbolize fidelity. Represent love. Loyalty. Represent something that is within you. Represent a feeling, a conviction. That is the reality. Just like you, at Christmas time or birthday, you buy a gift for your son, daughter, boyfriend, girlfriend or family member. You buy the gift for the person you like. And according to your love, if the person you are going to give the gift to is a friend, then the value of the gift is one. Is it not so? Yes or no? But when that gift will be given to a family member or someone you love so much, the value of the gift is higher. Is it not so? Do you want to prove your love for someone? Check the gift that this person gives you on your birthday. If it's a, a custom jewelry, if it's just anything purchased, in any corner, in the thrift store, it's because the love of that person is worthless. Yes or no? 
Ah, Bishop, perhaps the person has no money. Yes, of course, there are people who cannot afford to give a good gift. They give what they can. But the fact is that you show consideration for someone through an offering. The tithe represents loyalty, faithfulness. The offering represents your love, the feeling you have towards God. So when you bring tithes and offerings on the altar, in reality, it's not the money that has value, but it's what is within you. That's what makes the difference. You can see that there are people, you know, inside the church who are longer than you and that the life was unable to develop and you have already succeeded. And there are others that have achieved blessings quickly while you are in church for years and nothing has happened. Why? Because you delayed and have been slow to give your best. Your faith is insignificant. It's not a hundred percent. Your surrender is not a hundred percent. And obviously, your faith is not a hundred percent. Then when there's a total surrender, there is obedience. Obedience to the word of God. How was Abraham, Isaac, and Israel as the heroes of the past who surrendered, surrendered a hundred percent and were not greedy. There are people who give tithes the following way. $252.25. Just like that. Counting coins. These are the 10%. And they are unable to add a little more. They have to count the cents. Yes or no? I mean, how can people like that be blessed? They are measuring the coins to put inside the tithe envelope. The Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. I do not know how you give, but at least when you talk about tithe and offering, you applaud. I mean, there's already a joy. It's already something, yes or no. Already help the pastor. It's better than looking at the person and see her with her nose twisted. Your faith, my friend, our faith is measured by surrender. The person says, here is my life because everything I have is of God. So here I am on the altar. You do not worry about tomorrow because you know that the Lord you are giving to surely will provide for your needs of tomorrow. This is the faith that pleases God. It is this kind of faith that changes people's lives. It's not just coming to church, being faithful in tithe every month and giving an offering. And you get used to that pace. You do the same thing every month. I mean, if you do not change the way you think, how will you change your way of being? How will you change your situation? Do you understand what I'm talking about? Yes or no? I'll tell you something. Pay attention. Pay close attention. Each one of you, everyone who hears me throughout the world, all the planet, 
every person, no matter how small he may be, how poor he may be, how insignificant he may be to this world, everyone has a talent. You have a talent. There's a potential within you. There's a talent in you. Some have the talent to paint, to play instruments, washing, pressing, sewing, cooking. In short, everyone has a talent. Everyone has a talent. And do you know what is the problem? It is that you do not know your talent. You want to do what comes in your head and not what is inside you. When you put on the altar your entire life, the Holy Spirit shows your talent. He opens your eyes for you to see what you have within yourself. And you can make lots of money with that talent. Do you know what I mean? Yes or no? At the abolição, there was a guy who heard me talking about this. What do you do? Do you want to make money? I want. What can you do? The boy was thinking because he was unemployed. He said, I do not know what I can do. He was doing the chain of prayer of prosperity, which is done every Monday, the nation of the 318. And he had an idea of making popcorn. He bought a cart to make popcorn. He made and sold popcorn at the door of the church. He began to sell popcorn. The business prospered and he started tithing, offering. Then he bought a second cart to make popcorn and then the third. And soon he was a successful businessman. He worked as an assistant in the church and had employees out there working for him, selling popcorn. It was just an idea, a small idea, insignificant. But it gave him comfort. You have talent. And that talent you have, if you invest in it, you will have pleasure to do that and will make lots of money with that. Think with me. There is a lady here who also had an idea of making chocolate candies. Perhaps she is there, I don't know. She started working, making and selling sweets, prospering. People liked it, and the sales increased, and now she's growing financially, according to the email she sent me. What is your talent? You are faithful to God, but not fully. You believe in Him only more or less. No, my friends, God does not give just a part of himself. He does not give a half Holy Spirit, but all the Holy Spirit. He gives everything, but he just gives all of himself when he receives all of you. Amen? Do you understand? That is faith. That is what we call faith. 
That's what makes the difference. That's why there are people in church who prosper while others do not. And they are baptized with the Holy Spirit. They have the Holy Spirit. Esther and I were filled with the Holy Spirit. Lived a, a nice life. Perfect. Correct. But totally tied up until the revolt came. And there was a surrender. There was an attitude of courage. There was an attitude. And God has changed our lives because of that attitude. I mean, there was a surrender, an action from our part about what we believed in. And what has been your attitude regarding your faith? Do you have faith for what? You have faith that you come to church, pray, read the Bible, give tithes and offering, fast, and sing, raise your hand and say, Hallelujah, glory to God. You have faith for many things, but the faith that God wants from you is much more than that. He wants it in full, 100% of yourself on the altar. He wants you to live this world, this life, and give yourself a hundred percent. Is that what has happened to you? Honestly, pay attention, please. Your life is the result of your surrender on the altar. My life is the result of my surrender on the altar. Bishop Clodomir's life and other pastors and bishops are the result of what they have surrendered on the altar. Do you understand what I'm talking about? We live on the altar. We live of the altar. We live on the altar. We dwell on the altar. It's like I told you before. I can't speak for, for myself, not for others. God gave me economic conditions. God gave me financial conditions. But what do I do with them? Every day you see me working. If I do not work here making services, I supply my blog with posts for you. Every day I make TV program and radio program. Every day. Then a man at the age of 68 with a defined life, how, how many more years do I have left to live? Let's say I'll live another 30 years. But every day, my physical strength will decrease. Is it true or not? Let's say I'll live 30 years. 30 years. What would you do in my place? What would each one of you here do in my place? I ask you honestly, please ask people who hate me and criticize me. What would you do if you were bishop now? He is 68 years old now. Or would you continue working? Or would you continue doing what he does? I speak for myself because I'm already 68 years old. Only a madman who has a determination, one faith, do what I do. Is it true or not? Yes or no? I said I would like to have a boat, a speed boat. I do not even have a, a, a boat to paddle. 
or even a little boat. Do you understand? Our life is inside the house, working with the head, writing, praying, making programs on the TV, recording, etc., etc. For you, what will I gain with that? If I keep working, will I make more money? Not even a penny. If I stop working, will I lose a penny? I will not lose anything. So, why do I work? Why are we dedicating? Because of faith. Only because of faith. This willingness, this desire to see at least you have in what God has given us. That's the reality. This is called the surrender. Surrender. Total surrender. Amen? I'm saying this as an example of the kind of faith that pleases God. You know that doing all this they still want my death. Is it true or not? Well, while they are wishing my death, I'm living. Yes or no? So, my friends, what we are telling you is a fact, a reality. My joy or our joy our pleasure is your victory. If you do not win, we become the most miserable ones of the earth. Because we do not accept to preach a word to you and it does not fulfill in your life. But for that to happen, you have to participate. Do your part. Amen? What talent do you have? I, I don't know if you play instrument, guitar. Anyway, I, I do not know what you do. But you have a talent. Use it. If you cannot do anything, but you can play some instrument, then you should go to the square. You know, play your instrument. Put the hat on the floor because people put money in there and you will earn. Is it true or not? And I tell you more, if you put that talent in practice, even though it is a bit, you make ice cream, sell it and make $10 per day. You have faith in those $10. Give tithe and offering. What will happen? Jesus said, he who is faithful in little will be placed on the much. So that I scream gradually, not overnight, but gradually, that business will grow and become a great company, a great ice cream factory. Amen? Because nobody is born big, my friends. Or have you seen someone being born big? If born big, the mother dies. In the childbirth. Is it true or not? Everyone is born tiny and develops. You think that the mega companies that exist today began large? No. All of them were small. Sometimes you are deluded thinking, I, I want to explode. No, you have to go slow. Because when you go slowly, you are establishing your achievements. You know what I mean? I will explain. When you climb a ladder, you take a step and then you give another. Is it not so? Until you reach the top. You do not put both feet at once. 
It cannot be. So it's step by step. Use your talent. You have talent. You have talent. And you with talent being associated to God. God's partner. Then you will explode. You have to explode. Why? Because God is with you. And I can say this to you. It happened to me too. He in the old church of abolição. In a funeral home. If I told people it was a funeral home, nobody would come to the church. Do you understand? And I'll tell you more. When I would preach, there were only 10, 15, five people. There were so few that I would close my eyes and call people. I, I did not even look. I only said, listen, Jesus said, where two or more people are gathered in his name, he would be among them. Jesus is here. Do you believe? So, so I said, it's going to explode. Oh my God, bless these people. And that's it. There were so few that I had to recourse to the Bible to stimulate my faith. Stimulating my faith. So that's it. Don't be looking at circumstances. Look at what Jesus said. Do your best. Give your life. Give your life. Live your faith according to the word of God. Do not look at the circumstances. Do not look at others who are living in error. Who are living a life contrary to God. No. Do not look at others. And neither listen to others. Look at what Jesus said. Amen.